Well, good morning, church. Hope you've had a great week. We, we have had a great week ourselves, and we're here to celebrate together this morning. So this morning, we're going to start things off just a little bit different, and we're going to have a little fun together. So I don't care where you are, if you're in your house, your living room, I don't care who's sitting next to you, whether it's your kids, your family, your dog even, I want you to stand up with us today and, and just sing along with us and smile a little bit, because it is a good day that the Lord has made. So y'all worship with us today as we begin. In some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away, and I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by. Sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. And praise the Lord, I saw the light. And I saw the light. And I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Good morning, church family. How did you like that rendition that these guys played? That was awesome. I am looking forward to more a little bit later. Couple announcements though this morning I just want to bring you up to speed. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for your giving and your faithfulness. We will not or would not be able to do this without our church family being faithful. And those of you doing that are making a tremendous impact to be able to allow us to continue ministry and make sure that when these doors open back up, which I pray is very soon, that we will be able to get in there and hit on all cylinders and be ready to go. If you are looking for that, you can go to our website at churchatatus.com and click on the the button give or you can the link that you see in some of these things you can click there and you can do your giving online or you can continue to come to the church and drop it off at the door like some of you have been doing faithfully put your envelope in there but please please be faithful with that because that's what makes all of this possible Last thing that I want to share with you is that I'm following closely the process of the phases the governor and the president of the United States are coming out on this COVID-19 and how we're going to do that. We're already discussing what we need to do to be able to reopen the doors for our church when we get to that phase. And I'm praying that that comes quickly. And as we do that, we will keep you abreast with how those things are, are going. Until then, be safe where you are, impact your neighbors where you are, love each other as Christ loved you, now let's join our team together again in worship. God bless you. Cross before. 
before me, the world behind. No turning back, raising banner high. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the skies. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. And not to us, but to your name be the glory. And not to us, but to your name be the glory. Our hearts unfold before your throne. The only place for those who know it's not for us, it's all for you. Send your holy fire on this offering, let our worship burn for the world to see. It's not for us, it's all for you.
this morning, God, to know the truth that you, God, you have redeemed us, that you stepped out of heaven, that you came and bore a cross for my sins. God, and now as I choose to follow you, you bring life. God, so we are grateful for that today. We are grateful for that through song and now through your word. I pray that you speak through it all, God. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Good morning, church. Thank you for having us in your living room again this morning on Sunday. Uh, Today we're looking at episode six entitled The Indescribable Compassion, and it talks about two miracles that Jesus performed. So we're going to look at those this morning, and we're going to glean from that some information perhaps that we could use today in the midst of all this craziness that we are involved in. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 40. We're going to read through chapter 2 and verse 12. It's not as much as you might think, but, but it's the two uh, miracles that Jesus occurred, one with the leper and one with this paralytic that was lowered down from a ceiling. So Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40. Before we read, let's pray. Father, we come before you and I ask you to open our hearts and minds to your word. Wherever we are watching this, in a car, on a phone, in our home, on the TV, on a computer, God, let your spirit be the one that enlightens the truth of what you are trying to convey to us this morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. All right, Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40, it says, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing... You can make me clean. Verse 41 says, Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. 
And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Verse 45. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. This is the first miracle. This is that scene in the movie. You saw the leper coming, and we're going to talk about uh, what they are required to do and those kinds of things, but this was the first scene. Second one, chapter 2, same gospel, gospel of Mark, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterwards, some time had passed, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. Being unable to get get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Catch this. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? Which is easier to say? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Man, two cool stories that we see going on here. Let's look at this first one because I want to take these stories and try to glean some insight here for us to use 2020 right where we are. So skin, you know, is a, it, it's a big deal. Th- this disease that this guy had, this leprosy, was something that had set him apart from society. Its skin, you know, is one of the toughest organs in the body. Primary, it's our first primary line of defense. It has the ability to renew itself. It has endlessly, we've had cuts and bruises and stuff, and the skin has this ability to to heal itself. Uh, We do skin grafting. There's all kinds of things. Sunlight makes subtle changes to your body because of how God designed it with melanin. And so when you go out, it darkens itself to protect itself against the sun. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, about what it is. When that goes awry we got a problem and this this situation here uh, that the that they're talking about in this first century are these guys who are suffering with this obvious ailment this disease leprosy and and this this guy this leper that he heals just while he's headed to Galilee we I think we could see something in what Jesus does when he heals this guy the, the social taboos for lepers in Israel were pretty powerful. And, and, and they were powerful in their comprehensiveness. All the, all the details and rules you had to follow as a leper. No leper under any circumstances was to approach a non-leper. Uh, they were to stand at a distance and, and they were to shout uh, if, if they were coming to somebody uh, along the road, they were to stand off to the side and shout, unclean, unclean. And, and that's what they were told to do. So those people would not come within, uh, within a proximity of them where they could possibly catch this disease. 
And so it, it obviously didn't do anything. It's not the kind of regulation that's going to help them for their self-esteem. There's obviously, as you can imagine, uh, this leprosy was dreaded, not just for its disfiguring misery, but because it made people, watch this, complete social outcasts. Lepers were excluded from the general population and from any contact with people of God because of the defilement of, of being able to give sacrifice. Participation in religious life in the community <clears throat> was absolutely forgiven or forbidden. And any approach to the temple in Jerusalem was entirely out of the question. Rabbis of the time were known to have expressed opinions on the status of lepers, calling them living corpses. They had these ideas where, where the cure that they w w say in some of these ancient writings and texts about these guys was as difficult as resurrecting the dead. That these guys, basically, this term that they used in Hebrew uh, or, or Greek, this living corpse was, you're a dead man. Dead man walking. You, you are a guy who who you're already done, and we can't have anything more to do with you. Think about our society today, 2020, right where we are. We have, do we see that? I think some people, when we look at the homeless population, and we look at that, I can't get our head wrapped around. I don't know why this guy's like this. And man, I, I have a heart uh, for the homeless. I see veterans out there, and I see guys who just can't reconnect, and, and all of a sudden they're ostracized. But, but after a while, after you've been homeless for a while, you, you start to get these smells, and you start to take on this look that becomes homeless. We look at them, and, and what do we do when we see them? We're like, oh, this guy's going to ask me for money. He's going to want something. And, and we walk on the other side of the road. We start to step away and are like, I, I don't know, I don't know that I can, I just want to avoid the guy. And this is kind of how it was with these lepers. It was worse. These guys knew they had a death sentence and they couldn't defile themselves. They didn't want to catch it. But as we look at some of this uh, writing in the gospel of Mark, I want to pull out some interesting things on Jesus's perspective with this guy. Remember in the movie, the guys, when, when he said, no, 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 master, the guy's a leper. It's like, you, that is a death sentence for you to go to that guy. First thing you need to glean from this story is that no matter where you have been in your life, God is bigger than that. No matter where you've been in your life, God is bigger. Uh, there, there's an insight here. That after this leper approaches Jesus, when you read this common rendition of it, it says, moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand. That's what verse 41 says. Most English translations carry some variation of that theme or that word pity. It's not really written that way, but the early writers of the, of the, of the, of the scripture are like, ah, that, that's the best way to write it. But this word translates as anger. Now, that's kind of weird, but that would look weird there in English. Jesus looked at him with anger. But because the Greek has varying types of, of meanings to them, they went with the word pity because it's the compassionate side of what the word was saying. Because it's not the kind of anger where you get mad at somebody because they did you wrong and you're like, man, I'm, and you're, you're ticked off at him. It wasn't that kind of anger. This word anger is the kind of anger where he has this compassion, like why is this guy no longer to, or able to approach God? And his anger, his righteous anger is at the fact that He's mad at the society that has created a situation where some people are not allowed to approach God. This is really the word here. This, this anger, this compassionate anger, like, are you kidding me? I mean, his guys in the, in the scene that you saw there, the guys, if you watch that, they were saying, no, 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 don't go to the guy. Don't go to him. You're going you're gonna to be diseased. They're trying to stop him. So the word fits. It's kind of like, what? He's a human being. He needs this. <clears throat> Moved with that kind of pity or angered compassion, Jesus stretches out his hand. Every commentary you read on Mark, you, you, you have this 
this idea, you know, in, in seminary, studying them, uh, I had six different commentaries all pointing to the same thing. It's, it's not Jesus being mild and meek and, and mild-mannered when he comes to this guy. He's like, he comes to him, he's like, <clears throat> man, sin in the world has come to a place where some people can come to God and others cannot. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus has a righteous anger. He's upset that the guys who are following him, his disciples, are buying into the religiosity, if you will, of the world. And he takes a situation and he's going to turn it into a moment that is a teaching moment. He's going to, to use this to teach them that God is bigger and God is compassionate and God loves you and he doesn't care where you have been or where you are right now. But he's willing to touch you and to bring you to a place to make you whole. I think Jesus' anger <clears throat> was on behalf of that suffering leper. And he takes part in that suffering. Uh, the victim of social brutality, if you will. You see this in his pattern of ministry as he steps across lines. He's bothered by the social deprivation this guy has. These lepers, the neediest of the needy, were deprived of basic human fellowship, forced to flee the presence of healthy people, forced to live a pitiful life, unable to fulfill the deepest need of the human heart, the need for acts of loving kindness that apart from the normal human scene for healthy people, they're not allowed to have. So when Jesus starts hanging out with people like Nicodemus and these guys and going into their homes, when he, when he interacts with, with Matthew, who's a tax collector, and Matthew has no friends, it's these people, he's saying, God, watch this, is a great equalizer. But no person is better than anybody else. He loves you as his child. Well, when we look at this this way, it makes the story make more sense. The Bible says Jesus sternly charged him to go show yourself to the priest. He's still kind of ticked off. He's like, you know what? <laughs> go show yourself to the guy. Do all the things you're supposed to do that were required by the law of Moses. Do all those things and show him you're clean. He sets a precedent. Verses 43 and 44, go and show yourself to the priest. Jesus had provided something not even the priest or the rabbis could provide. Watch this. Readmission to the human and religious community for people who should never have been excluded in the first place. God really comes to heal the world. Not just physically, spiritually, socially, mentally. He had not been prevented, prevented from proclaiming the message by this guy who seems to interrupt them on their way to a place they were traveling to. He's not upset about that. He's upset that this guy has to be ostracized in the first place. So he turns the situation itself into a powerful proclamation. Watch this. All the way to the cross, Jesus will be trying to get those who think where the Messiah is, there is no misery. Think about that. Where the Messiah is, there is no misery. A lot of society thinks that. 
If God's here, then there should be no suffering. Instead, what he is doing all the way to the cross in his ministry is this, to accept a new perspective of where there is misery, there is the Messiah. Watch, we need him. He's better than any doctor that can help in this COVID crisis. The best physician, the one who can change you. So we look at the second story. It's referenced in Matthew 9, 1 through 8, Mark 2, 1 through 12, which is what we read, and Luke 5, 18 through 26. We're taking the account from Mark. I'm going to glean some other information on there. But it, it, it goes through and, and gives us an insight about this paralytic. So they, they're bringing this paralyzed man to Jesus so that he could heal him. But there's this large crowd outside and, 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 and they are blocking the doorway. And they can't get him to him. So they go to the roof and they pull back the tiles on the, on the roof and they cut through so they can lower this guy down in front of Jesus and the crowd. And Jesus, as you, we look, uh, we read Mark, uh, Luke has an insight on here I want to catch. It says, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus when they could not find a way to him because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the guy, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, it could, it could mean the guy as well, but he sees the great faith that these guys had to say, you know what? This guy who's paralyzed from the waist down and has no hope, who's been isolated, who is alone, our only hope is in Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees of the law that were there thinking to themselves, who's this guy who can say this stuff? Jesus, there's an insight there. Jesus looks at their hearts on what they were reasoning. And then he says, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed, everyone, even the Pharisees, and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This guy's probably well known in the community. The, the crowds are now getting big because of the guy that says some days later that this event took place. So the guy, after Jesus said to the guy, the leper, don't tell anybody about this. Just go show yourself to the uh, priest that you're clean and, and give your sacrifice that Moses required. He, he can't contain himself apparently he goes and he tells a bunch of people and now the crowds are so big we read in the, at the latter part of Mark in that particular story that he can't even get into cities now. Everybody's like, it's Jesus and everyone's bringing him to him. Everybody is excited about knowing what, watch this, what Jesus can actually do. Now we read about this, we read about this stuff in America, we, we, we have churches on every corner. We, we see this stuff happen, but, but people I think, I'm going to share something really tough with you today. I think we are confused with the Jesus that perhaps we know of and are following. So you have two guys who needed hope. One, an ostracized individual of society. The other, a shut-in alone and with no hope. The fix for both of them is Jesus. I'm wondering if there's a chance because of what we have heard growing up in America and what we have seen growing up in America, an America that has a Jesus on every corner, kind of like the Santa Claus ringing the bell on every corner at Christmas time for the Salvation Army. That perhaps we've bought into 
a fake Jesus. And now we've grown up, perhaps you've grown up or you know people who've grown up who have doubts that religion doesn't work. Jesus doesn't work. I I tried Christianity and it didn't work for me. I prayed for stuff in my life and it didn't work for me. I asked God to fix this situation in my life. It didn't work for me. I asked God to, to deliver me from my addiction and it didn't work. that Jesus. And so on that Jesus, that perception of Jesus, the one that didn't work, you possibly have come to a conclusion about this. I want to ask you something for a minute. Perhaps the Jesus you've witnessed not picking on any church or any person or anybody, this includes me. Perhaps the Jesus you have witnessed is a fake representation of the real Jesus. And perhaps you have not met the real Jesus at all. You see, the scripture has never been wrong historically or scientifically. If therefore the scripture cannot be proved fallible, if in fact it is infallible, then there is a good chance that the Jesus that we have probably bumped into in our life, I'm talking about a fake representation of one, was not really Jesus at all. That, that the reasoning we tied to it, you heard me say this before, made him like a vending machine Jesus. I should be able to put a dollar in here and get a Coke out of it. I should be able to to ask for something and I should get it. That's what I should get. And And I don't see it. I think that's because you can't really follow a vending machine. That's something that stays in one place and it's convenient for you or for me to go to when we need it. That's not Jesus at all. See, Jesus says, follow me. This becomes the difficult part. There's a good chance that the Jesus you've met, the one who's not answered prayers, the one who's not delivered you from the addictions that control you, is not Jesus at all. Perhaps you need to meet the real Jesus. The Jesus who healed the leper and who healed the paralytic. And everybody saw it. And everybody, the scripture says, was amazed by it. And history says tens of thousands of people started following him because of the truth of what they have witnessed. You know, you can meet him right now. However, it will require you, just like it required me, to confess that you're a sinner. See, this is the hard part about Jesus. When we're confronted with the truth, it's like this Bible study we had on Wednesday in holiness, we are confronted with the fact that we're not holy. As a matter of fact, we're unholy. And we know that there's no hope for that holiness that he's asking us to have unless we follow him. So the word holiness, a couple of Bible studies that go on Wednesday night, talks about what it really means is to be set apart. You're not set apart in the vending machine, Jesus. You're set apart when you follow the real Jesus. That's what sets you apart. That's what God sees and knows is holy. Are you really going to follow him with everything you have? Are there things in your life that control you, the need to be needed, the need to be accepted, the need to be affirmed? 
addictions that control you to make the pain go away, relationships that control you to make the pain go away. In order to meet Jesus for real, the real Jesus, it requires us to confess that we're sinners and that those sins that have controlled us because, well, we haven't been walking away from temptation. Instead, we've embraced temptation. And in fact, the desires of your heart crave that particular thing that you need to be delivered from. And the consequences have mounted up. And now, you desperately need hope. Like the leper whose physical ailment has ostracized him from society. Or the paralytic who just needs hope and is all alone. Perhaps maybe you're one of those people. My friend, listen to me. When we accept what the real Jesus has accomplished on the cross, when you accept what the real Jesus, the Jesus of this infallible scripture, what he has accomplished on the cross historically, that he, listen to me, jealously seeks a relationship with you because he loves you. He wants to heal you. This is why he was mad at his disciples when he went to this leper. It wasn't pity, it was, it was anger, it was a compassionate anger. Like, what, what are you talking about? Would you think this guy doesn't need me as much as you need me? Maybe you're that guy. Maybe you're that girl. You need to know that God jealously seeks a relationship with you because he loves you and he wants to heal you. Watch this. He wants to change you. He wants you to walk away from your past and choose to follow him. Hence, every time you go to the vending machine expecting Jesus to fix you and you don't get what you want, you get mad. That's not your God. That's a convenience thing. Can you fix this for me, God? God does love you, and he wants a relationship with you, but he wants you to follow his way to do it. And this is where our temptations and struggles get in the way and, and try to stop us from, no, I'll fix it myself. I, I, all I need is another relationship. All I need is, is this thing in my life, and I will be good. All I need is this, and I will be good to go. And we take it into our own hands. And it's not the Jesus of these stories we read this morning. Of this history we read this morning. He wants you to walk away from your past and choose to follow him. Listen to me. Will you do that? Will you do that right where you are and bow your head, and if you're willing, ignore the person sitting next to you, but just all of you in the room where you are, bow your head and pray. And pray with me right now. If you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're willing to walk away and say, God, I, I'm a sinner and I need you, you pray this prayer with me. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's somebody watching this right now who's struggling. They're either like that leper who is a social outcast or they're like this paralytic who is alone and they don't have hope. And just it's never worked for them because the Jesus they've been following isn't a Jesus at all to follow. That God, if they would pray this prayer, if they would repent from their sins and just say, God, I need you, that they can be made whole again. So pray this with me. 
pray this out loud right where you are or in your heart quietly, however you want to. But if you pray this and, and you mean it, God can change you right now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I might not know a lot about you. But I know that you died for me on the cross and the blood that you shed paid for all my sins. And man, I have got a lot of them. And I can't even imagine that you could pay for all that. But your word, your truth says you can and you did. So God, forgive me of those sins. I believe that you were buried and raised again so I could have eternal life with you. And I need to know that there is more to life than this. Where I am. So God, come into my heart right now and save me, a sinner. And I repent and I'm turning away from my past and I am following you from this day forward. I ask you to begin a healing on me and take away any addiction or take away any desire that I have for things that have controlled me. And Father, that I would just covenant right here, right now in this moment to follow you the rest of my life. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. For I ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, you need to follow up with it. Jesus commanded us to be baptized after we have chosen to follow him. It's a way to get our head and our heart on the same page. Man, we will come right here one at a time so that we can have social distancing and we will baptize you and we will put it on the air and let people see it so that that can be your testimony of saying, I'm following Christ and I don't care who knows it because I am choosing him to be my Lord. It's important that you follow up. So email us on the, on the website. Go there. Find me, Tom, at churchatattis.com. Email me. Say, I made that decision. I need to follow up with that. And it's just as important you need to share this decision you've just made with other people. <laughs> this is what these people did. The result was tens of thousands of people started coming to Jesus because they saw the change in this individual. They'll see the change in you. And they'll scratch their head and they'll wonder what in the world, how in the world could that have happened? Watch this. It happened because you have met the real Jesus Christ. And his word is true. Share your decision with a friend. Man, type it on the screen at the Bible study on Wednesday. Send an email to me saying, I, I chose Christ. And then when you follow up with me and you followed up with us on Facebook or, or text us or emailed us, you, you've done something to follow up with that. You set up that time with us. We're going to fill up this baptistry behind me and we're going to do what Jesus commanded us to do. I was baptized as a little Catholic kid. But when I decided to follow Jesus. I decided to show the world like he asked me to. Say, this is what I believe. I'm buried with him. And I'm raised into the newness of life. That's the picture of being baptized, immersed, and, and raised again. Nail this decision down the same way the nails on the cross nailed it down for you. Causing it to be finished. Causing you to be set free. 
and don't let anything stand in your way of Jesus Christ. But let people see you walk in a way that is holy, set apart, so that they'll wonder what's happened to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your truth. We give you the honor and the glory today. Two simple stories of history that occurred that made such a huge change in those two people's lives that changed tens of thousands of others. God, help us to do the same as we set ourselves apart and start to peel off stuff that is unholy in our lives as we follow you. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.